Good afternoon. A cartoonist and the cartoon editor of The New Yorker, Bob Mankoff is one of the nation's leading commentators on the role of human, humor in American business, politics, and life. A successful, successful entrepreneur, he created the Cartoon Bank, one of the world's largest and most influential cartoon licensing businesses. Recently, Bob has been partnering with the data scientists at Microsoft, Google, the University of Wisconsin, and IBM's Watson team to find out what's funny and why. Unfortunately, my stuff is not getting on that <laughs> list. Um, some preliminary progress has been made uh, with image recognition of cartoons as well as algorithms to discriminate between funny and unfunny captions. Today, he will present a talk titled, What's Funny and Why AI? Please join me in welcoming Bob Mankoff. Thank you. Wow, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, what so, some of what you said was true. <laughs> I thought this was the dawn of doom kind. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and honestly, I, I could have slept late. You know, I could have said, well, wake me when it's, actu it's actually doom. And I really like the, I like this getup. I, I don't think you can look dorkier than this. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I, I couldn't go into the Condi building if, like, Anna Wintour saw me. I'd be get kicked out. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about sort of what I do. Uh, humor, artificial intelligence, what humor is, and really what progress we can make, what's possible, possible to make with it. Uh, so I gave, oh, don't stop. No, that's not working. That's nice. Okay, I, I actually gave a talk at the IBM uh, uh, Watson Center. And, uh, you know, obviously huge progress has been made, or progress anyway. Computers beat uh, Kasparov at chess, Lisa Dahl at Go. And, but it was interesting what happened on Jeopardy. Uh, okay. We're to Ken Jennings now, 18,200 going in. Bram Stoker is what we're looking for, and we find. Who is Stoker? I, for one, welcome our new computer. <laughs> Well, so Ken Jennings did something a computer can't do there, <laughs> right? He made a joke, and he made a really complicated joke, because when you look at sort of, and of course, Watson didn't get it. <laughs> uh, but when you, uh, ah, yes, humor, the quality of being amusing or comic, especially as expressed in literature or speech, still don't get it. <laughs> But when you look at the joke that he actually made and the layers that that joke goes back to, I for one welcome our insect overlords and how it became a meme on the internet and how we could quickly use it at that time, uh, uh, that was sort of extraordinary and yet easy for a human being to do if you have a sense of humor. Uh, amazing, since Mr. Jennings is so clever, he deserves to be killed last. <laughs> And, of course, that's the doom part, right? Because, oh, Stephen Hawkins fears robots could take over in 100 years. It's, it's interesting. A lot of New Yorker cartoons are sort of prescient. They actually well anticipate decades. So this is a New Yorker cartoon from 1974, uh, which shows, of course, the computer of that time. And the head mounted is the uh, head mounted of the guy. Uh, and, and everyone's talking about this, a world without work, the second, you know, machine age. Uh, and once again, when you look, this is, this, is a, this is a cartoon from the 60s, okay, by Alan Dunn. And said, the problem is the effect of automation and unemployment in the next decade. See if you can solve that. <laughs> uh, now, the... Uh, uh, Watson and Watson as an aide is, uh, you know, the idea is, well, you know, it's taking over robotic work, putting cars together. But really here when they talk about it, make no mistake that eventually the idea is uh, uh, you may be looking at the machine, you may be consulting the machine, but more and more you're going to be trusting the machine uh, uh, as right. Uh, and once again, you know, become your doctor. Once again, in New York, you're going to go, oh, go, God, not here. And that's also from the 60s. Uh, but it's not, just, it's not just doctors. It's coding itself, right? The end of code. So the idea is basically through neural learning and everything, everything is going to be uh, taken over. So, you know, the question I have besides why the remote doesn't work, ah, 
uh, that's, that's bad. I said, now it works. Good. We'll just go through the quick lecture all over again. Now I understand. Or you can, Jenny. Oh, God. <laughs> Nothing, so I will point out that the most funny things in the world are when things go wrong. And this is an example of it going wrong. Okay. So, but now it's right. And all is right with the world. Uh, uh, <coughs> so, but one of the questions is, what jobs will be left? What will be taken over? So here's the job I do, right? I'm a cartoon editor of the New Yorker. I'm a cartoonist for the magazine. Uh, uh, here's a little 60 minutes episode which sort of <coughs> compresses a little bit of what I do. Hey, how are you? Oh, Robert, well, I suppose you came in here to hear some of the cartoons. Every Wednesday, a nervous band of ink-stained wretches gathers at Bob Mancock's office. Let's see what you got here, eh? Hoping he gets home to sell him a cartoon. As for what they're paid, no one's talking. How many can accept that I really don't know? There's the grizzled veteran Sam Gross, who figures he's submitted 30,000 cartoons, give or take. 30,000? Yeah. Many consider this his masterpiece. A dog at Heaven's Gate asking, is there any chance of getting my testicles <laughs> So that's part of what I do. <laughs> I see people. My wife tells me it's not a real job. <laughs> She's sort of right. And yet in mentoring and talking to people and fooling around with that and bringing in a whole new generation of cartoonists and trying to see what talent is and what they can encourage them, all those cartoonists, and that's a small part of it because I get to see a thousand cartoons a week. And for the cartoonists who are doing that, they're doing 10 and 20 a we uh, every week. So when someone tells me they have an idea for a cartoon, I'm not that impressed. I went to my cardiologist, and because I had an arrhythmia, and you know, he puts me on, I'm on the machines and everything, wants to put me at ease, and he said, uh, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm the cartoon editor of the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> Shuts off all the machines. He says, you know, I have an idea for a cartoon. <laughs> I, I said, great, I have an idea for a bypass. <laughs> So that's part of what I do. Uh, I look the book, uh, which isn't in yet, but if you buy the book tomorrow, I'll figure out some way to get you something, a drawing for it, but, uh, uh, in which I sort of recount my life and talk about the caption contest and various things I'm going to talk about here. Now, most of you are not going to read the book, so I'm just, we're just <laughs> going to do a really quick review. <laughs> I say it's very funny. I saved you 1995. <laughs> uh, okay, about the author. Well, it's me. This is the cartoon that's you know part of the book, or the, I took the title because this is when you do cartoons. Uh, I've done almost a thousand for the New Yorker. And one of the differences between an amateur and a professional is an amateur really knows what's good. 
They really know what's great, what's funny, and what isn't, and, and it isn't a professional doesn't. They always know whatever, they know they never know what's going to be a hit. They never know what's going to catch on. This was well, the last cartoon I did in a batch of 15. It was actually a variant of a, of a snotty line. It would say in, in New York and Queens, like, if I never see you again, it'll be too soon. It was just a contradiction. I actually said to someone on the phone. Tina Brown loved it. And she said, I said, great, said, fine, print it. That's wonderful. It paid me money. Anyway, so that cartoon, so the way you actually make money at living like doing this is in New York, it does pay you, but then they get licensed, reprinted, and the like. So now this cartoon is in the Yale Book of Quotations, right next to that other famous humorous Mao Tse Tang. <laughs> so I'll tell you some jokes that I made up when I was 70. Uh, so one of the things I want you to do is each time you think about your laugh and why you're laughing, what's the, what's the structure of the thing? So when I'm 70, I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 70, I said, the good news is it could be worse. The bad news is it will be. <laughs> uh, I'm 70. The good news is 70 is the new 50. The bad news is dead is not the new alive. <laughs> And when you're a guy and you wake up and you're 70, you're stiff everywhere but where you want to be. <laughs> Those are the jokes. Here are some of my cartoons. I'm sorry, dear, I wasn't listening. Could you repeat what you said since we've been married? <laughs> On the one hand, eliminating the middleman would result in lower costs, increased sales, and greater consumer satisfaction. On the other hand, with the middleman. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you did catch us at a bad time. <laughs> and while there's no reason yet to panic, I think it's only prudent we make preparations to panic. <laughs> a billion is a thousand millions. Why wasn't I informed of this? <laughs> uh, there is no justice in the world. There's some justice in the world. The world is just. <laughs> and now that's product placement. <laughs> So all of these are humor in some sense, and one of the things which we're going to try to look at is, well, what is, is there a common thing other than your laugh? Is there some other, is there something uh, else that is happening? Now when people, oh, Hamlet's duplex. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things is, out of the thousand cartoons, I think about 50 to 60 to David Remnick, because, because he, he's the guy who makes the final decision on everything in the magazine, even the pagination. That's the page numbers. <laughs> so when I showed him this cartoon, he said, that's dumb. And I said, that's funny. <laughs> he said, that's dumb. I said, that's funny. <laughs> because a lot of what's funny is dumb. Actually, it is. It actually connects with this playful, dumb, logical, illogical side of it. We have to actually have these contradictory feelings in our mind at the same time to appreciate uh, humor. People ask me, well, how do you get ideas for cartoons? And I say, I think of them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to think, actually, of humorous ideas. We'll get to the caption content, and you say, well, how do you think of them? Now, I'm going to tell you a little story, which isn't true, but it'll be funny, <laughs> about how to think of it. Well, one of the things is, for something to be funny, it can't be completely normal. You have to start off with something a little bit wrong, right? OK, that, so that's right. That can't be funny, right? It's just a guy sitting in a chair. Now, right is never funny. Wrong is marginally funnier. It's just a little bit. It's certainly not a joke. So what I'm going to say is, see, so that's right, that's wrong, and now it's funny. In other words, I've distorted the frame, right, wrong, funny, because now you need some sort of cognitive completion to make it work. OK, that's right, as such, as a trope, as a cliche, OK? Now, that's wrong. <laughs> you shouldn't be carrying. It's disturbing. You're a little bit disturbed already by it. Your mind is itching. You're saying, ooh, that's wrong, and that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And in an instant, it's, it, it's amazing because now you could explain why it's funny, but for that to happen, and it happened so fast, it had to happen at an unconscious level for you to put together these frames of reference. Okay, that's right. Uh, I mean, it's bad for the lemmings, but what can I say? It's a cartoon. I have to live with it because they go off the cliff. That's wrong. <laughs> And that's funny because that's what lemmings believe. <laughs> <laughs> lemmings are extraordinarily religious. <laughs> uh, I will say that all of the cartoons, while at the New Yorker, and I, some of them are just silly, but most of them actually, rather than being straight editorial, have this <coughs> oblique meaning, a subtle criticism of belief in, in, in general. Like for me, this is because I'm an atheist. This is like the like the other joke is wh why is there so much strife between all the different sects and religion when they're all just arguing about who has the best imaginary friend? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the ways to look at this is Arthur Kessler, who wrote a lot of books, uh, politically involved, uh, uh, Darkness at Noon, about the Soviet Union, the Gulag, all of that. But he also dealt with, with the idea of science, humor, and art in the act of creation. And he coined this term bisociation, which meant associating different frames of reference at the same time. So this joke here, French army knife, which has all corkscrews, you're putting together these different frames of reference. Okay, here for this, the Vesperados, right? <laughs> so you got your Vespers, you got your Desperado, you got both of them going together, and then you have this mashup there. Now a lot of jokes are like that, absolutely. You sort of get it, you put together the frames of reference, there's this little spark of recognition. It's what Elliot Orin call, calls an appropriate incongruity. It's incongruous. It doesn't make sense, but it does make sense. At the same time, the sense it makes is spurious. It, it's false sense. We know it's not real sense. Uh, John Locke said the difference between judgment and what he calls fancy, which he meant humor, was that in judgment, we try to make distinctions between things that are actually very similar. And in fancy, we try to bring together similarities for things that are, in fact, totally uh, you know, totally disparate. Now, I'm going to show you here. This is many women are more at ease with a female doctor. That's why I'm wearing the wig. <laughs> now, this is uh, eye pupil size. Now, eye pupil size tends to increase uh, basically by attention. And also, when you show people cartoons, it's the moment that they get it. Okay? So, this is a sort of a classic as we watch it, at the moment that the person gets the cartoon, boom. That's when it occurs. Now, some jokes, the jokes I've told you are sort of like that. Uh, so one of the big distinctions in humor is between what's called incongruity resolution. And there's huge arcane arguments within the community. Is it really resolution? Is it so pseudo resolution? But we all understand that there are some jokes we get. Right? We just get it. And there's some that we laugh at because there's nothing to get. There's something to enjoy. Yes, he has deep pockets, but I never realized how short his arms are. Let's look at this. That's what I hate about the city. You roast in summer, you freeze in winter, and the rest of the time it's carnivorous pig bats. <laughs> now, there's nothing to get about that. <laughs> there's nothing to, to get. Somehow it seems like an, uh, there is an incongruity. It is appropriate in a way because the sentence structure and everything seems normal. And of course, there's a little of sort of humor poetry here, carnivorous pig bats. You're putting it together, but it's not like that. Now it turns out it's not so much there's a complete distinction between what people like and that everybody likes straight jokes, but the people who have uh, an affinity or an extreme dislike for uh, for this kind of humor, uh, differentiates people in terms of personality. People who must have incongruity resolution are people who need a lot of resolution in other things. Fixed, rigid ideas, they're going to be disturbed by the fact that, I, I don't get it. What is that? You know what I mean? Uh, and enjoyment of nonsense humor tends to be, you tend to be more open to, you know, different kinds of experience. 
if you favor this kind of humor, or at least really enjoy it, you're likely to make diagrams that are a little bit more varied, rather than diagrams uh, that are very orderly. You're likely to be more open to different forms of art, rather than representational art. Uh, you probably voted for him rather than him. <laughs> I'm just going to take this call now. <laughs> and I'm going to shut off my phone, which I should have done a long time ago, but I didn't. That's all right. By the way, this is, uh, I give a lot of these talks, and this is uh, uh, my advice. Don't worry about fucking up. <laughs> Don't worry about anything go wrong. Just go on. <laughs> okay, but what about here? Okay, I would still say that's definitely the case, absolutely, that just if I talk to Donald Trump, is he someone who's going to really like a weird joke? I don't think so. Now here I'm going to show you something really weird and interesting. Oh no, I forgot to show you something not so weird, but still interesting. So part of what, part of what we actually like depends dispositional, right? So if, for instance, if you ever have a favorable attitude towards a New Yorker and ridicule someone, if you have an unfavorable attitude, like Donald Trump, it's maximal humor, and the other way around, it's flipped. So the cartoons we published, which were not pro-Trump like this one, and Will, to the best of my ability, which is terrific ability, by the way, everyone agrees I have fantastic <laughs> ability, so there's no problem in my abil ability, believe me. Okay, so that's a cartoon. And then, of course, this cartoon, when that was an issue. So whether, so whether you like that or not will depend dispositionally about that. Now, here I'm going to show you something really weird. Really weird. Uh, a friend of mine, a guy I know, Jamie Brew, has uh, developed what's called a predictive text emulator. And what he did was he, he took the, the transcript of the debate uh, and, and he put different corpora in there, okay? So you have Trump and Hillary. And so let's just watch it as, it as it unfolds the words depending on the probability of how the people spoke. Okay, so first it's going to be Mr. Trump. I think I should have never been taken away from the world. I don't know who broke the country, but I would like to say that she deserves to get audited almost every year. <laughs> It's very important to me to say that I do not support her campaign against the greatest people on the campaign. <laughs> Hillary. I happen to support the debt, but I certainly will actually work to be president of the United States, and I think it's time that we know the facts of the worst financial crisis in the world. I have been told that I was Latina, Donald, <laughs> well, actually, I happen to be president. <laughs> uh, and now, actually, there's a little mechanical Turk working in there, in that, in that, in that this program, Jamie is only allowed to, to, to pick the words that come up from the actual thing. And if you look up, Jamie Brew is the guy who runs Clickhole for The Onion. And he's got this very interesting program in which a person collaborates, and the it could be humor, it could be songs. For instance, you can download with the program, let's say you can take all the lyrics for, of David Bowie. And then you have presented the probabilities, and eventually you're actually creating a new song based on that lyric. So it's, a very, it's at a very sort of nascent stage, but it's interesting. And one of the things that it shows also is about humor is framing and context. If I had just shown you that without anything, you would have just been confused. But the fact that I said it was a predictive text emulator gave you the framework to say, oh, th this is now in the realm of funny. Uh, now, why, but why would any of these in anything cause this? my first wife. <laughs> okay, now just think. I'm always going, why did you laugh at that? <laughs> I, I do this in that 
Uh, it, it, one of the things I do this, and you can tell, I sort of tell jokes and do bits and shtick and whatever thing. And I used to have sort of a routine in which I said, it's my first wife, and it was like everything else worked out, yeah, but whatever, that the humor part was fine. And then all of a sudden I realized that people were just laughing at me saying that was my first wife. Uh, but so laughter is this really puzzling phenomenon. And one of the problems with computers to some extent, of course, is there's nothing there. There's no emotion. There's no laughter. So even if we're on a continuum from mild amusement, we understand that this basic potential for this response is important. And where does it come from? Well, one thing that laughter is really interesting, watch all the speakers here and everything. For the most part, we laugh more after what we say than other people say. We frame our context. Laughter constantly permeates normal uh, 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 human conversation. Uh, won't go into all of that. But the other interesting thing about laughter is and this, this goes back to this right, wrong, funny. I mean, th there is this edge, really, between sadness and laughter. Hap you know, uh, you do laugh enough that you can cry and uh, vice versa. And in my view, th this, this is sort of a really interesting video. Watch this of this kid. <laughs> so, so you see, but what I'm what I'm trying what I'm trying to show you is that the, the, here's my actual opinion of it that that originally laughter is a type of emotional regulation response that has to do with fear that even in a joke in that small in that in that small part that exists before you get it is an unknowing and a really a disturbance. One of the really interesting things about laughter, but I'm not talking about contagious laughter, is that it ends the comic event. It ends it. In other words, it doesn't go on. When, when you laugh at a joke, you laugh at it. And for me, the way I'm looking at that is that the essential part of humor is some type of cognitive and emotional conflict. And when you look at laughter as it normally occurs, it clears the conflict. It says you no longer have to worry about it or think about it or whatever. So, but. Me, I don't laugh. <laughs> it's not my job. <laughs> my job is to evaluate. I'm looking at a thousand cartoons uh, uh, every week. And there's no laugh meter. And the truth is, and I'll show you this with the contest, that the evaluation of humor, of hundreds of cartoons, the evaluation of anything diminishes actually our pleasure of the thing. If we review books, if we review movies, it's not about we can still evaluate that they are good. We will say they are good, but we're not really enjoying them. Not in the same way as when it's unmediated. You know, you would do that if you're, uh, honestly, one of the worst things in the world is to become a connoisseur. <laughs> Everything is bad. <laughs> so it's nothing is good enough, right? You're a connoisseur and everything. I'm a connoisseur of humor, so pity me. Uh, uh, the, uh, but I have a job to do, so I do it. So all the, those cartoons come in. And so here's here. William Hogarth's The Laughing Audience, and everybody is having a good time except this guy who's the critic. Right? Now, so what I have to watch out is that I don't become that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. That's a danger because you completely start to separate from your audience. And uh, it's this thing. It's not like I want to completely give over to the audience. I'll talk about that with the caption contest. But I don't want to completely forget that there's an audience. Uh, that's a danger, especially if you're dealing with humor. OK, so now we're going to go to the caption contest, which is on the back page of the magazine. So every uh, every week on the back page, there's a contest that you enter. There are three finalists. So here's this the cubicle with the grave. Oh, great, more office drama. So that was his name. I thought he wanted to be shredded. <laughs> okay. So so every so every week there are, there are, there's one you enter. Uh, there's the winner. I can't hear you. The tub is running. And one you enter. And so it's a, it's a sort of weird thing because it's five weeks before the the contest actually appears before we have the winner. 
And in this case, th they were zombies, okay, attacking these people. One the guy had chocolate cookies, she had a gun, said, let's hope for some nut allergies. <laughs> and of course, being the New Yorker, there is nothing people will not be offended at. <laughs> I could write a book called The Annals of the Offended. <laughs> uh, Although humor is often funniest when it is timely and nut allergies are currently an epidemic, the notion of nuts as a weapon, as one writer suggests in this week's cartoon contest, is not funny to parents of children with life that are, okay, these are zombies. <laughs> we want that. These are zombies. Okay. Here's a good, another example. I've only been gluten-free for a week, but I'm already really annoying. <laughs> I'm, this is not part of the capture contest. Okay. <laughs> So here's the response, okay. Shame on you people for publishing your cartoon. I've only been gluten-free for a week, but I'm already annoying for those of us with celiac. Well, of course, it's not about people with celiac disease. It's about people who wish they had celiac disease. <laughs> people who have celiac disease envy. But look, I, look, you, you've got to listen to it said, uh, uh, try walking a mile in her shoes. In this case, that makes a lot of sense because with this person, you'd be a mile away from them <laughs> and you would have their shoes. Uh, okay, so entries to the caption contest, there's, this is actually out of date, we're up to like 539. So there's been 2,000, you know, 787, 2,787,000. Weekly average uh, is about 5,000. 5, so your chances of winning are this. <laughs> That's not really true if you're funny. <laughs> they're slightly better than that. But obviously, it's hard to win the contest. And one of the reasons it's incredibly hard to win the contest is because it's almost impossible to judge the contest. <laughs> there are 5,000 entries. OK, some facts. So obviously, most of the entries, uh, most of the entries come from New York, California, all these blue states. <laughs> blue for a reason here. Uh, <laughs> when, when you actually look in terms of, uh, of, of the number of submissions, there's much more equality. And if you factor in everything, uh, Alaska is the funniest state. <laughs> Just because they have so few submissions and a lot of winners. Okay. Interestingly, in terms of, this is another fact, many more men enter the contest than women, and so more men win. But when you factor in, once again, actually the number of women, uh, the uh, women win at a greater percentage. And we have actually quite a few women, women uh, uh, win winners. But pretty much in proportion, maybe even a, bit, a little higher. Uh, okay. A lot of celebrities enter the contest. This is from Ted Danson, Bored to Death. So he's talking about it. What would a police doc say to a suicidal bear? <laughs> <laughs> you can bear it. God, that's terrible. I'm never going to win this thing. No, he's never going to win that thing. <laughs> what do you do, like? Uh, um. <laughs> now, uh, so, so many people enter it, I mean, there have been four or 540 contests. I think the number of people have entered over 500 times. Uh, Roger Ebert won after 107 tries uh, with uh, uh, this caption. I'm not going to say the word I'm thinking of. Uh, <laughs> for, for, uh, at, at that point, Peter McGraw uh, 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 and Phil Fernback did an analysis. They wanted to find out, well, is there some structure in the, in the winners? What can we tell from? Because what happens, you'll see, is my assistant originally made a short list of the 5,000. And from that, we did a survey of the New Yorker editors. And what they said was novelty captions that use words that are uncommon and other captions are more likely to make the short list that we choose from. Punctuation captions that avoid exclamation points, commas, and question marks are more likely to make the short list. Length captions that use fewer words are more likely to be selected for abstractness and imaginability. Captions that are hard to visualize are more likely to make the short list. By that, they meant like, I'm not going to say the word I'm thinking of. You couldn't possibly visualize what the, what, what the drawing was. Well, true for some and not for others. <laughs> OK, so here's a winner of <laughs> obj objection, your honor, alleged killer whale. In fact, many, many people had this. So just because many people come up with a caption does not mean it's not 
funny or we're not going to pick it. So when you look at it, novelty, it wasn't novel. Punctuation, well, you needed, you needed <laughs> the exclamation parking there. Length, length tends to be true. Abstractness and imaginability, not true at all in here because objection, Your Honor, alleged killer whale, you'd have a pretty good shot at saying what that was. Uh, be funny, absolutely. So a lot of the stuff in the analysis that goes on is not really so much humor as sort of markers of maybe markers of humor, markers of writing. Uh, so how, a little history of how we judge it. This is my cartoonist, my uh, previous cartoon assistant, cartoonist Mark Philippe Eskenazi, uh, which we call Mark Philippe Eskenaz for short. <laughs> <laughs> I blew that joke. It's a good joke. <laughs> Here's, th this is from a film called Very Semi-Serious, which is on HBO, which is about me, the New Yorker cartoonist, a lot of other things. Prudent caption here. Shortly before I started is when they started the caption contest. The assistant needed to be someone who could uh, judge all those captions. People go onto the internet and enter their idea for the best gag line for that cartoon, and then some poor soul sorts through all of those at the, at the end of the week. I mean, mainly my job was to just read 8,000 captions a week. That was fun, but it was also soul crushing. My eyes were just leveled <laughs> off at sort of like a, a certain blurriness increased several, whatever they are, like blindness points <laughs> um, after staring at those captions for so long. <laughs> so generally speaking, I can have an assistant for about a year and a half and two years. Before fMRIs were real, there's nothing left. <laughs> it's actually, I mean, he said soul crushing. It's a numbing task, and it was like taking eight hours. So, Mark, I say goodbye to Mark, and I, uh, uh, oh, the decision process. Oh, what happened? No, no, no. Don't do this. Oh, no. Ah, here we go. New, so my new cartoon assistant is Colin Stokes. Not new now, he's been there two years. And so he also would do the same thing, go through this, go through the whole list. And then he would give me, this is for the zombies, what was called a short list, you know, where there are these categories. So that you could make some sort of distinction. You wouldn't want all from the same thing. And really that's how we were doing it for a while, where at, after that I would put the, I would pick these eight and would put it on Survey Monkey. And uh, then we would get these ratings from, let's say, the editors at the New Yorker. And one of the things that always stood out is that when you look at people rating jokes uh, differently, you see the real diversity, right? In fact, it's om it, it, even more in this, it's almost always, even the, the funniest ones, just as many people think it's unfunny. So in a place like this, or when you're in a group, or when you can communicate with people, there's a type of consensus. There is a contagion in laughter. Separate, you see the real diversity of it. And, and here's like, real, if, if we really look at the diversity here, here are two people who rated, this person rated almost everything funny, this person rated everything <laughs> unfunny. One of the things I'm trying to do in the new rating systems is take this into account. If it's someone who rates everything funny and they're rating something funny, it count, should count less and, and the other way around. Uh, okay, so then I actually got interested and had some background in, 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 in programming and this stuff. I said, well, is there a different way to do it? it just simply because it's actually a bad way to do it, to have someone look at 5,000 captions or even me look at hundreds. So uh, I, I partnered with Daphne Shahaf and Eric Horvitz at Microsoft. And what we try to do is develop an algorithm that could uh, uh, look at all the captions and sort them. And basically the way that th they did it was this. They would uh, use mechanical turkers who would be looking at sets of captions. And only when there was an 80% agreement that caption A was funnier than caption B would it sort of go into the algorithm and try to figure it out. Uh, so teaching the computer what's funny. So look at this picture here, right? So we see 
you know, so that's the incongruous element, right? It's a car, it's also an animal. And so some sample, cat, what's it going to take you in to get this car today? Relax, it just smells the other car on you. It runs entirely. So you see this comes in. Now one of the interesting things, and I've done other work, is that although there's 5,000 captions, uh, they come in in huge clusters. Okay, so this is called collective discourse, and it's a, it, it's, it's a really an interesting discourse on originality or the lack thereof. Okay, nobody knows what anybody else is doing, and yet very quickly, within the first hundred, a couple of hundred captions, you see all the categories that the culture is going to uh, sprout up. So, uh, you know, here most of it was a hybrid, roadkill, runs on, per, beast, mileage, miles per, so the clusters uh, 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 come in. Uh, then the other thing the Turkers did is it, uh, they, we tried to look, they, they, they tagged the, the strange elements and the normal elements and looking for captions that would bridge both. So a caption that would, so the background context is a car salesman, anomalous is animal legs, so something that says it got 25 miles for goat would be one. When it, when it, when it ended up ranking the top versus the bottom, these are the ones that it ranked as good, these are the ones that are ranked as not so good. Uh, the, uh, so I'll just quickly go through this, but what it presented in the algorithm was very, very simple, which is you put the joke later, it's more readable and stuff like that. And the, uh, uh, the, ac the prediction accuracy compared to people is 64%. It's not like it's nothing, okay, it's not like it's nothing, but <laughs> it's not enough to be useful to me. 64% is not. So, the next step was saying, how could we do better? Well, let's use computers and people. Oh, uh, that was the winning caption. Okay, so I partnered with, the, with, with Rob Nowak and Kevin Jamison at the University of Wisconsin because they had algorithms for judgment, adaptive algorithms that you could crowdsource to, to many, many people. And the way the algorithm works here is that we present all 5,000 captions to the 600,000 people have entered the contest, and I usually send out an email to about 20,000. I say, have at it. What's happening is that, is that, the, is that as the captions, oh, let, me, let me go on here. Okay, basically this is what you see at the New Yorker site. Unfunny, somewhat funny, funny. And uh, so I'll just go, so people would rate it. They would keep seeing this, keep rating, keep rating, uh, keep rating. And then, like in this instance, the number of participants, this is early on, there were 6,754 raters and they made 187,498 judgments. At a certain point, the algorithm can say, I believe with this degree of probability that if we ran this over again, you would get these types of rankings. Uh, here, here's an example of that. Okay, uh, uh, so in this one, which was from last week, there were 22,000 people who made these judgments. So here, honey, run the can opener quick. So this is the value. So this, these ones that are closer to it, I'm not that confident that they would be different in another thing. As we go further away from it, I have more, uh, 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 more confidence. So that was, I'm not a big cat person, so that was, that was rated. <laughs> Now, it's, tur it's turning out that our, on our real survey to judge is, I think this one is going to win. So the confidence was 30%, I think. How I use this is, I don't just take these. I use this as an input. And it's a very useful input. It's a very useful input. It quickly, you know, scales, uh, says, okay, these are the ones that people like. Now I can make other judgments because I can, I can make judgments about originality, about cleverness, about all other things. But at least now I'm not being driven crazy by uh, uh, trying to understand what the basic humor process is with these people. So <laughs> I, got, I got this email from the Google DeepMind people. Team. You know, I'm a researcher in artificial intelligence, but they, they, you know, uh, uh, I believe that the success of artificial intelligence will ultimately not be measured in how well it goes to games ago, uh, or whether it can respond to your emails, but rather whether an artificial mind can one day get its cartoon caption published in the New Yorker. I'm only half joking. Well, not really half joking, because then I got this diagram from him. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, so the idea is to use your, their, their photo, uh, photo software to tweak that. So 
So I gave them like 20,000 cartoons, and now they're going to try to look, can you? Originally, if they're not even labeled a cartoon, create a semantic vector from which the words could be generated, and then create another algorithm to, to, to judge it. Uh, here's a little conversation. Uh, uh, I asked him, I, I argued winning the cat would come first, because I want to know, does he really want to win it? I, and then I could question, does the AI play by the same rules as a person for each contest? You can only enter one caption. We wouldn't want it to cheat, would we? I said, great, your odds just went from slim to none. <laughs> uh, uh, honestly, as of yet, there has been almost no pro it, 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 just just describing what the what in the cartoon is almost impossible. And the other part is, it's not like Go, where the computer itself can start to discriminate and, and iterate itself over and over again. Uh, this is what Lawrence Wood, who has won the contest seven times, does to create a caption. I've had him keep a diary for the last year of all of his entries. And so it's an interest. This is the human process, okay? I thought it, this is the, there's a whale on the back. I thought about whales' traits and abilities, and then tried to see if there was any way to relate these traits and abilities to what was happening in the car. I first thought about whale songs, and because the woman's holding in her ears, if she doesn't like the song, and the man's look like he's defending the song, I considered submitting. Really, I like this song. I like that caption because it referred to a typical argument between a driver and a passenger when they disagree about what's on the radio. I then thought about the echolation, uh, echolocation angle. It's a navigation system, and most cars have such systems, so I considered submitting one of the following two captions. You wanted a navigation system. This is a better than GPS. I avoided using the actual term echolocation because I thought it would be make the caption too obvious, but I was wrong because <laughs> one of the finalists you selected. Anyway, this is... This is the human process, and this is something that right now is far beyond the reach of a computer can do. Uh, one thing I will say to conclude, then we'll do <laughs> questions, is sometimes the simplest caption is the best. It sort of makes you stop and think, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, I, I hope I've made you stop and think a little bit about humor and AI, and I'm happy to answer any and all your questions. Thank you. Before we get to the questions, I do want to make one quick announcement. As you alluded to earlier in the presentation, the books are not available today. So when you go and buy your book tomorrow, you can take it to the registration desk, and they'll take down your information, and, and Bob will send, I'll you, send you. I'll send you a little drive. And at this time, uh, please uh, step up to the front uh, if you have any questions so we can get them on the recording. Thank you. You're already at the front. Right. That's great. I was wondering if you could comment on the Trump cartoon that appears on the cover of The New Yorker this week. What was the thought process behind that? And well, that, to know that, who that's, did it. Ac that's actually the cover artist, Barry Blitt, Miss Congeniality. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that very, that, uh, that uh, why don't you describe for the people what the cartoon is? Um, yeah. Microphone. Um, it's Trump, and he's kind of teetering on high heels, like he's quite uncomfortable. And he's very large, and then there's a Miss ribbon across him that says Miss, Miss Congeniality. Congeniality. Yeah. <laughs> that. And of course, the, the, the uh, uh, Barry Blitt does this wonderful work. This is very much editorial cartooning, hitting Trump where he is most vulnerable, and in which, which uh, uh, hoping to enrage him even more. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I, and, but that's very much dispositional, you know what I mean? That's going to depend on which side you're on. But I do think, it, I, I do think it, 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 it works so well, I think, for a lot of people. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, here this, this guy's a pretty wide load himself. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question? Say a few words about the interview process when you're looking for assistance. What happens Looking for an assistant? Uh, you, you in the market? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I mean, they, they have to have, uh, uh, they have to both have their own sense of humor, and especially as I said, the, the younger people, I'm actually interested in their sense of humor, not just mine. Because one of the things is that humor is constantly evolving. Like, just, just that little crazy program that I showed you, or when you look at meme culture, or the speed at which things are happening, where less and less is actually content uh, so much, and much more is social network and almost self-identification of the network as being funny. 
And humor is primarily a social process. So to some extent, I have to be in uh, touch with that. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me about the program is this idea of synthetic humor. By synthetic, I mean it's not humor that is a person, and it's not humor that's a machine. It's humor that is understood to be these types of collaborations, these types of playful explorations with the machine interfaces, and is judged in its own way as that. Uh, so uh, I'm, looking, I'm, oh, I'm looking for, obviously, a kid who's bright, uh, who, is, who is funny, and who can actually do work I don't want to do. <laughs> I mean, all of these organizations runs on, run on the backs of 25-year-olds. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, someone, and someone who I have this, uh, uh, really a simpatico with in terms of in human, and someone I can actually fool around with. <laughs> because this, this job, there's a serious part of it, getting the magazine, but that's just a fun part that you should be able to enjoy. I think you have a question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, how do you feel, or if you feel, that there's a new wave of political correctness that's affecting, not really affecting directly humor, but is that like that people are considering and that it, like how everything is sort of affected? Yeah, there's no question that, it, you know, to me, look, there's part of political correctness that's correct, and then there's a part that's become more and more political. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there's, there, it's one of these things which is a correct, uh, uh, an essentially correct sentiment. Don't be cruel, don't punch down, don't do this. But then it gets defined so it, 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 th there tends to be, it, or for people who are very ideological, uh, 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 hegemony, that they, they keep w wanting more and more and more. And then eventually, humor, human needs some freedom to be wrong, to be offensive, and to also to realize that there are worse things than being to telling an offensive joke. Like, let's say someone tells me, uh, they, I was offended by the, oh, yeah, this, is <coughs> too, this is too good. The, the <laughs> so we had a joke, and it was a very hard joke to get, because it shows like two explorers, and they're in quicksand, and they're talking to each other, you know, they're up to the waist, and they're saying, thank God for the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I explained it to people, and then so I explained it to the person and said, I got the email back, so you mean the elephant is dead? <laughs> I don't find that funny. <laughs> I said, well, I said, you can't see, the, it's cropped, you can't see, but the elephant's trunk is <laughs> coming out <laughs> of the quicksand on the side, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, that the, the people are, not, you know, are, are worried that, that in a cartoon, there is, first of all, we don't, that there's, a, there's no elephant there. There's nothing there, you know, so this, it starts to be, it starts to have this bandwagon effect where let's, let's find out, you know, more and more that uh, is that. So I do think it's, um, I don't think it's totally wrong um, to have sensibilities. It's obviously right to have sensibilities, but if you're that, but, it, but if you're, but, but part of the, part of the job of humor, and not so much in the New Yorker, I'll tell you, the real, the real, the real uh, restriction on free speech or, or not, uh, terrorist or political correctness so much as, as commercialism itself, <coughs> advertising. That's the real restriction. That's why you either do things or you don't. That's why you either have transgressive stuff <laughs> in the media or don't have transgressive, because it's, it's either making money or taking money away from you. So, uh, 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 but I, 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 in terms of actual free speech, I, I mean, when people say, okay, you, you're offended, sometimes I say, Oh, I'm very sorry you were offended by that cartoon, and, uh, and then what happened? I mean, what happened after you were offended? Could, <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, what happened? Was it like uh, you couldn't eat lunch, or <laughs> did it extend to dinner? Was it a sleepless night? <laughs> and then like this post-traumatic stress syndrome where you kept getting up and thinking about that? Or did it, I mean, generally, uh, were you okay in a few weeks? I just want to keep checking in on you, just in case. Uh, you know, so that's what I mean. It's, you know, what, what does it actually mean? Uh, anyway, other questions? Anybody have? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so a lot of the current uses of AI are in really data-heavy stuff in sort of STEM fields. Uh, and I think part of that is because in art, you have to be aware of um, nuances in culture and what's going on in current events and things like that to have something that's really worth other people looking at, worth looking at for other yeah. people. Um, so do you see a point where um, 
a computer or a robot can generate some form of art or humor or something that's very human, and for another person to come and say, I prefer what the robot created as opposed to what a human can create? Like, do you see that? I, I actually thing? don't. I think that the humor problem points out a huge, the huge gulf, which is the gulf essentially of consciousness, self, of emotions, of, 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 of who we are. And that uh, when, when the guy from Google says he doesn't think it's that much, he, he actually does. In a way, he doesn't. He understands that's rule-based or patent recognition. He understands this other thing, or just these conversations that we're having require a self, a consciousness, that. So I don't, uh, it, it's not like it's, it, it's, not like it's uh, 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 theoretically inconceivable. It's just like uh, uh, with these things that we're doing now, I don't see it, but I do see, I do see these collaborations where you're letting, especially in terms of of, of, of creating associations or poetry. Anyway, hi. Uh, I, th I think you kind of spoke to that, but I'd like to yeah. try and respin it because, in some ways, what you're saying about humor, I think, is really important to the CS guys, which is humor is getting it wrong the right way. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're making a mistake that works better than reality would because it says something deeper. Yeah, it's about appropriately itself. improper. Yeah. I mean, when you see a great comedian like Louis C.K., to some extent, these people, so what's happening in comedy now is harkens back to ancient trickster figures going out to the far edges of what's socially acceptable to tell us really where those edges are, where we think the edges are, to make us think about those things. We don't really do that much that in the New York since we're sort of turning back, but I see comedy is So it. it's kind of like getting it wrong. You know, yeah. her, his arms were too short, his pockets were deep. Yeah, like, yeah. Like it's not working. But that's also what they're trying to do in this area in AI called transfer learning. This is like something else. And they got, I mean, computers can't do metaphors for shucks, you know? and. Um, DeepMind won it, I think it was 75 different video games, but it could never take the learning from one and put it in another. And what they're trying to do is figure out metaphors and commonalities, and you're sort of working the same Well, there's field. a guy, to Tony v Veal, who's, all, who's working at also calling, uh, 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 you know, uh, exploding the myth of creativity, the founding. He's trying to do metaphors and stuff. And they work to the extent that you know the computer is doing it. Where I see, and this is where I've been talking to the people at Watson, the real opening is not to try to have the whole game be the computer, but to actually use the computer as a tool for what we do best. Right. You can't encode taste. What's that? You can't encode taste. Right. Uh, and so well, my, my question is like, how hard is it explaining it to the CS guys? Well, it, it, it's easy for some people. Actually, they totally get that like uh, Gur, uh, Gurdus Banavar uh, totally gets that this is like one of the grand challenges. It's, even though it seems like a trivial thing, humor, it's actually huge because it immediately exposes the, the, the complexity of just all the fun we had here, all the jokes that you make here. It, it requires, first of all, it requires real world knowledge, real world, actual sensory human experience and human emotions. To act. And then it also requires sort of joke knowledge. So that's why, you know, when, when you actually have, when you, any of the theories which are absolutely right, okay, it's an appropriate incongruity, but you can't define that for a computer. It's, it's wrong and it's right, but you can't define that to the computer. So one of the things that humor is, is the thing that we do so naturally. Look, the, many of the things the computer does, we can't do at all. And this thing we can do naturally. So one of the thing, one of the takeaways for me is, what are the young people going to be doing in the future? They better be doing creative things. If they're doing things that are completely rule-based, uh, really whether it's medicine or law, you know, I think uh, they will be uh, spending a lot of time laughing at my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, or at least we have time. We got a little bit. Yeah, one more. You obviously enjoy humor. Do you carry this outside the office? Do you find yourself being more humorous than serious outside? I love to, my, 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 I, my, my mantra is leave no joke unjoked. <laughs> <laughs> leave no joke unjoked, tell the joke, if it falls flat, so what, fool around with people. It's, it's a great way to, uh, you know, to interact. If I'm, if I, uh, it really, anywhere I am, if I'm in a, uh, like this, I'll just leave you with this. So I'm in a Starbucks in Seattle, and uh, I'm the only person there, and I ask, just want a regular, you know, latte, and they say, what's your name? I said, why do you need my name? I'm the only one here. 
<laughs> so no, we, we always write the name. I said, fine, uh, Steve, but that's not my real name. Is that okay? <laughs> anyway, Bob is my real name. Thanks. <laughs>